Hey guys, I'm gonna show you a new way to create a really gorgeous, easy white marble. Stay tuned and enjoy the video. We don't do a lot of pour in place anymore. Most of our jobs are fabricated in our shop, but we have a client that is doing a complete home remodel and they're wanting a large island and the island has been built basically around this pole. They can't get rid of the pole because it is structurally uh, there and they can't get rid of it and they're going to be doing rock, putting rock around it. So what we've done is they've already built their uh, the uh, island basically. They've already set the sink and what we've done is we came in and Kenny built the countertop and did the seam. We're still working on the seam. Um, so that when we pour, it's going to be a seamless pour. Now the countertop right now is lifted up high so that we can still work and get some uh, roundovers and everything underneath here and, and work a little bit once it's poured. We'll lower it down onto the sink that's already in place. So I'm excited to bring this to you. The rest of the countertops in the kitchen will be fabricated and poured at our shop. So we'll bring you that as well. We just finished sanding the Bondo and because now the Bondo is really uh, very slick and very smooth, just as a precaution, as extra insurance, we're gonna come in with the XIM uh, bonding primer and which is what I use when I go over like a laminate or a natural stone, metal, glass, anything like that. Um, to ensure that we have really good adhesion before we go to the next step, which is gonna be either our bare paint and primer, or in this case, the stone coat countertop epoxy undercoating. All right, so thin winds on this. We want really thin coat. It doesn't have to be perfect. All I'm really doing is getting it over the Bondo area. And my advice to use if you have short arms like me, get a extender. <laughs> I'm just using a quarter inch nap roller. You can use just about anything that you want to lay this down. Just as long as you get a really smooth finish. And then I'm gonna come around on all the edges, anywhere that we did Bondo. I'll be doing the XIM. And again, this countertop is raised. It's, this is not the position it's gonna be in. As soon as we finish pouring it, we'll lower it down. Uh, the sink has already been installed and kind of the Allen was built around it. So we have it raised up just so it's a lot easier to work with. So we did two coats of the XIM, let them dry, and it's time for the undercoating. The reason we're doing the undercoating as opposed to uh, a latex or bare paint primer is because we're able to pour about four hours after we apply the undercoating. If you use a latex paint, then you need to wait at least 24 hours so that all that uh, paint can off gas and not cause uh, issues with your epoxy. So what we do is we store our rollers in the can. So it makes it really easy. You always know where your rollers are. Again, when you're using the undercoating, you're doing thin to win. You don't wanna do thick coats on this. Two thin coats, lightly sanding in between each coat. So our undercoating has dried overnight. We don't have to let it dry overnight because we're using the stone coat countertop uh, epoxy undercoating. Usually it only has to dry for four hours, but because of our time constraints, it's the next day. All right, so we are going to do 
two ounces per square foot instead of the recommended three ounces that we do on most of the pours. The reason we're doing two ounces is because I want this finished, the, the base coat or my, my first layer of the epoxy, I don't want it to move very much. So that's why I'm coming in with two ounces. Um, all right, so let's get mixing. I'm using the Stone Coat Countertop Art Coat. And the reason I'm doing the Art Coat is because the Art Coat has um, a high amount of the UV protection. So anytime you do anything white or has white accents, you want to make sure that you do use the Art Coat. So I've mixed up my epoxy and I've split it into four different cups. Um, what I'm doing, I'm going to create depth with the way that I mix my color. So one bucket, I'm gonna come in with the white alumilite dye, and I'm gonna mix that white very opaque. I want uh, to create depth, so by using different variations of the color intensity, I'm gonna get some depth. So we'll start off getting a very opaque color. So what I wanna do is make sure that when I check my color consistency that I cannot see through to the grain of the stick, and that's about where I want it. On this one, I'm gonna do it a very sheer milky white. So I'm only gonna put a couple of drops to start off with and build as I go. All right, so I like this right here. All right, perfect. All right, so this one you could see is very milky. Then we're gonna do clear. And on the smaller bucket, we're gonna go ahead and do it transparent as well. And then we're gonna add a little bit of gray spray paint. It's smoky gray. And that's gonna give us the tint of the gray that I want in my accent color. Putting a little bit of that into the white. And I want a very light color gray. A little bit more. All right, it's a very, very light shade of gray. So the customer also told me she wants just a little bit of bling, not very much, just a tiny bit. So I'm gonna add diamond dust and I'm gonna put it into the white. Now putting into the white opaque is just going to give me a shimmer of the glitter when the light hits it just right. It's not gonna be in your face, lots of bling. Because it's going into an opaque color, I can be a little more generous. Okay, because I'm vertically challenged, obviously I'm on a chair. All right, so we're gonna start laying down with no rhyme to reason. I don't want any kind of pattern at all. Now I'm gonna come back in with the transparent white. Do the same thing. All right, good. Now we'll come in with the clear. Now because our background, our base color is white, that's gonna give us one more level of the color. So that's why actually we've got basically four different shades here that we're working with. The clear just kind of opens up a window down into the substrate. Now I'm gonna torch it just a little bit it's a little bit cool in here. They have their AC set at about 71. So by me torching it a little bit, it's gonna help me on my next step when I go to start manipulating it and laying it out flat. All right, so the next step, laying down the pattern, I'm gonna use a brush. You can use a roller if you want to. Don't use your hand for this step. I'm a huge proponent in using my hand, but for this particular finish, I really like the brush and the pattern that it lays down. So I'm gonna load up my brush, kind of prime it, I guess. I'm just gonna start cross hatching and start covering the surface. Not really too worried about my edges. Now we're not gonna have a lot of drip on our edges because we're only at two ounces per square foot. So we're really gonna cover our edges when we come back in there with our flood coat. Now don't over cross hatch, don't over mix it. Because if you do, then what you're doing is you're basically just blending all the colors together. You want separation, 
of your colors, but you want it to be very faint. You want to be able to see that white opaque. You want to be able to see that milky white and that clear. Now, because we're at two ounces instead of three, you're going to have to be very conscious of all of your dry spots. Make sure you don't have surface tension. Now, like I said, I'm going to address my edges when I pour my flood coat. That's when I'll make sure I have really good coverage. If you're looking for a really classy finish, you could actually leave it like this and not go to the next step where we add our gray veining. This is a very, very pretty finish, but they wanted just a little bit of gray. If it starts to get thick on you, you can hit it with a torch again. Again, because we have two ounces per square foot, you may notice that the surface may cure with a little bit of waves in it. And that's okay because this is just our color coat. Our flood coat will be back at three ounces per square foot and it's gonna cover up any unevenness that we have in the surface. Now you could get the same effect if you did three ounces per square foot on this. You would just have to wait quite a bit longer for the epoxy to stop moving before you went to the next level or the next step. And that's where we add our gray lines. All right, so the veining pattern is a very, very light, very random pattern. So we're just gonna kind of sprinkle that over there. We'll let it sit for just a little bit. Then we're gonna take our brush and we're gonna kind of soften it out. I'm not really worried about the little drips. I'm letting it go over the side, kind of bringing that over. All right, so we got that first layer. Now I'm gonna come back in and I'm gonna add a little bit darker gray. So I'm gonna come back and retint. Add a little bit more gray. Now this is not much different, just gonna give me just a little bit of a contrast. All right, so now we're gonna kind of blur it all out so we don't have hard lines. So I'm taking my brush, and again, because it is just two ounces per square foot, it's easy to kind of blur this out. You don't want to rub hard. You can kind of do different directions. If you have some little lines that you want to straighten out or blend out, you can do that. If you have hard straight lines, you can come kind of go crossways, soften those hard vertical lines. You can actually change the directions of your lines if you want to. If you've got it going one way and you kind of want it to go the other way, kind of manipulate it with that brush. If you wait a little longer to do this, your lines won't move as much if you want more distinct lines. I know all y'all are waiting for me to face plant in this thing. So how much you blur this is completely up to you. It's how soft do you want your lines? Do you want distinct lines? Do you want very soft lines? Do you want both? Okay, so we blurred all the lines. Now I'm coming back in with a uh, clear isopropyl alcohol. Now another way to do this, if you wanted a little bit more color and a little bit more shimmer, is instead of just coming in with clear, come in with a maybe a pewter or a silver mixed uh, mica mixed with your alcohol and that way when you spray it you're bringing in one more element of color but we're going to come up nice and high i have my my spray bottle set to where it's 
not a super fine mist, but not big, heavy, heavy drops. All right, so we're just gonna come over here, start misting the top. What that's gonna do, it's gonna blur our surface even more. Now I'm not squeezing my trigger hard. I'm just squeezing it just enough to get that product out. You don't want to have too much alcohol. Too much alcohol will take this pattern and make it completely run. Now what you want to do since you've added the isopropyl alcohol is isopropyl alcohol has a tendency to make little divots that'll go down to your substrate. So about 10 or 15 minutes after uh, the alcohol starts to evaporate, you wanna go back and double check, make sure you don't have the divots. If you do, little surface tension, just tap them with your finger. Okay, so we are back. We're getting ready to do the flood coat. The color coat is dried and it's actually four days later. Because we're doing this pour on site and we are actually in the middle of teaching our pro class, I wasn't able to come back the next day and do the flood coat. The homeowners are out of the home, so I don't have to worry about working around their schedule, which makes it really nice. Because our flood coat needs to be able to get a mechanical bond with our color coat, that's why I'm using the sanding disc, 220. We've uh, scuffed sand the entire surface. Now for the edges. I like to hand sand that uh, and take the sanding disc off. And then what I'll do is I'll just kind of bend the sandpaper and be very, very light on your edges. I have a lot of people asking me about edges. They're having issues with getting really pretty edges. And I'm gonna give you guys a few tips that we've kind of learned throughout our career doing this. One, um, never use a electric sander on your edges. I'm telling you, no matter how good you are, at some point you're going to burn through the edges. Now, because I'm at two ounces per square foot, I know I keep repeating that, but it's very important because our edges are going to be more delicate than normal. So what you can do if you feel that you're really thin in one area, um, I'm pretty happy with my edges on this particular project. I, I have felt them. I feel like I have plenty of material. But if you if you have really wavy edges or you know this uh, piece that you're doing is going to be uh, in a really high traffic uh, environment, you can do this. I'll have my epoxy. I'll just reach in. You can even use a paintbrush. And I'm gonna come and I'm just gonna coat my edges with the clear epoxy. Now, as I go all the way around, obviously I'm gonna get some epoxy on the top, meaning when it cures, my top is not gonna be really smooth. Doesn't bother me at all, because what's gonna happen then is when I come over with the full flood coat, it's going to take all of that, level it out. Now I'm going to have three levels or three, um, I guess, three layers of epoxy. My color coat, which is where we are now, the extra of the clear, and now the total flood coat. So I'm really increasing the durability of my edges by doing just that edge. If you do that, you'll want to coat it let it sit for 24 hours, and then you're gonna come and do the full flint coat. So you are adding an extra 24 hours, but you're also increasing the durability and kind of the peace of mind that you have really good edges. Another thing, especially if you're doing a pour in place, how do I address my drips? Couple of things that we do. Every couple of hours, there's several things you can do. Actually, you can tape it, which to me is, is okay, but uh, what we prefer to do is every couple of hours or so, we'll come and we'll just run a popsicle stick to grab our drips. After about six hours or so, your product is gonna quit dripping. So what I'll do is I'll, one last time, I'll run that popsicle stick around the perimeter 
so that now I don't have any visible little drips. Then I'll take 91% isopropyl alcohol and I'll really put it thick in my hand and I'll rub underneath and it's like butter. It's going to take that epoxy because your epoxy is still very, very manipulable. You, you can really kind of move it and, and mash it around, but it's not, it's not stringy. So I'm able to really level out those drips. Also what I'll do, uh, I'll do the same thing to my edges. If my edges are a little bit wavy, I can just spray that alcohol. I can rub my edges and now my edges are perfect. So that's a pro tip, have fun. All right, so unfortunately, you have your little accidents that happen, especially when you're on location. In this case, there was one little corner that got bumped while the paint was wet and it pulled the paint off so you can see the substrate just a little bit. Well, now we're here, we're on location. Um, obviously, I've got to pull my flood coat today. So what I'm gonna do, and it's very important and it makes life so much easier, is when you go get ready to do your uh, pour, bring some spray paint that is going to match whatever colors you have in your color coat. And now if it's a really big piece, a big, um, mistake or a really big chunk that's been hit, you're going to have to rethink this. But the little tiny, tiny imperfections, you can handle them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with some white Rust-Oleum because uh, obviously I have a white background and I'm going to just faux paint a little bit of this area so that you're not going to be able to see it. So I'm going to very lightly come in and tap that. and let that dry. And then you're not gonna be able to see it at all when I do my flood coat and voila. All right, so we are ready to pour the flood coat. We've sanded, we've wiped the dust off, cleaned it up with isopropyl alcohol and are ready to go. All right, so we're going three uh, ounces per square foot, which is the recommended amount uh, for the stone coat countertop. Now for our flood coat, it's the exact same material that we used for our color coat. We're just not putting anything in it as far as color, except for a little secret sauce, which is the diamond dust. My favorite, just gonna take a tiny bit and all it's gonna do is add just enough sparkle so when the light hits it just right, it's gonna kinda catch your eye. So, can't can't do anything without diamond dust. All right, so here we go. We have uh, 96 ounces here, and this is how little of the diamond dust that I'm gonna put in there. So for 96 ounces, this is it. Very, very tiny amount. I do not want this to be the focal point of the finish. I just want it to tease everybody just a little bit. All right. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pour it over the entire surface. And I know you guys know I'm a huge proponent of using my hands, but because this is a large area, uh, I am gonna trial it out to kind of help me smooth it and make sure that all of the epoxy is basically level across the surface. But I am gonna come back with my hand and level it all out. All of the product is now down onto the surface. I'm gonna heat it up just a little bit. It's a little bit cool in here. Um, so it's just gonna help me draw it out a little bit better. When I'm trialing, I'm going to keep my trial so that this portion is nice and flat. If I go too straight up and down, I'm gonna move too much product. If I lay it down like this, I'm really not gonna move as much product as I need. Move. So keep it nice level. I am going to bring it right to the edge. I'm not going to push anything over the edge right now. I don't want to waste that product. I'll come back and I'll address those edges once I get everything trialed out. I've got plenty of open time 
with this art coat. And the reason I'm using the art coat, just like in the color coat, my art coat has high amounts of the UV additives. So I've got nice long open time. All right, the product is now trawled all over the surface. Now I'm gonna come in with my hand, level everything out to where I can feel it really smooth. Then I'm gonna address my edges. I really like using my hands instead of coming in with a chop brush. And the reason I do that is because I can, I like to be able to feel the surface, make sure I don't have any little particles that have jumped in there. Um, it just gives me better satisfaction that I'm getting it done correctly. Also, there is a 100% chance that I will not get a hairbrush particle or a little um, what do you call those things? Hairbrush bristle, I guess is what I'm trying to say, in my surface. All right, so I want you to see how I do my edges. When I come over here, I'll take my hand and I'll obviously I'll push the product over the edge. But then I'll go the next step and I'll run it under and I'll really make sure that that product is getting up underneath that edge so that as the epoxy rolls, it's going to kind of come back a little bit further than just build up right there on that edge. And I make sure I have a really nice edge. All right, time to torch. So what we'll do, we'll come in, I'll torch three times, about three to five minutes between each torching, and then I'm gonna be done. If I torch too late into the pour, say an hour after this has started to set up, what that's going to do is it gonna, it's going to cause me to have ripples. So don't do that. It'll also cause you to uh, maybe have little dimples pop up because what's happening is as your product is curing and then you come in later with a torch, you're actually creating bubbles because your flood coat is starting to set up. When that bubble pops, it creates a little divot and it does not self-level and close up, that's another reason why you get waves. Another thing you'll wanna do if you're pouring in place is make sure that the homeowner or you tape up all the vents, you turn off the AC if possible, and you turn the lights off. You don't want any air movement across this flood coat. That in itself can cause ripples. All right, I'm not really worried about dust bunnies on this flood coat and the reason is is because I know I'm going to come back in with the ultimate top coat so any little dust bunnies that may land on the surface I'm going to sand out anyway and then I'm going to roll on my ultimate top coat. So when I do my edges I don't do a lot of heat on my edges and the reason is if I really uh, torch and heat up my edges too much what happens is I've really made that epoxy thin and it's just gonna run off. So when I do hit my edges, it's ever so lightly and very quickly. All right, so we've let it set up about an hour longer uh, than when we first pulled our drips, just so it can get a little uh, more tacky. Now I'm gonna tell you guys how to get perfect edges. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. 91% alcohol. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my glove hand now you have to do this when the epoxy is at the stage where you touch it and your finger comes away clean. If you get strings, your epoxy is not ready yet. Um, so it has to be at that, that, that window where you could rub it and it's not going to uh, come off the surface. All right, so I've got my glove, alcohol. And now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna come under this edge where I just uh, scraped it with the popsicle stick. And now I'm gonna start rubbing. And I'm gonna rub until I feel the underneath get perfectly smooth. All right, now my edge is perfect. Also, if I have ripples in my edges, this is when I can fix it. Again, I'm gonna load up my glove and I'm just gonna run my hand along that edge and it is absolutely 
going to feel like butter. Any little tiny imperfection or any little wave that I get, I can address it right now. Okay, so we are done with the epoxy portion of the pour. We'll come back in 24 hours and we'll apply and roll on the ultimate top coat in gloss. The customer wants the gloss. Guys, I hope you liked this video. Stay tuned for part two, where we're gonna show you where we completed the entire project. We're gonna fabricate the outer countertops in our shop and pour and do the flood coat there in our studio. The reason we didn't do the gloss coat on location at this point is because there's gonna be a lot of construction going on in the house and I wanted to ensure that once we did put the top coat on there, there would be no way that it would be damaged or get paint on it. If there are some scratches on the top that we just did, all I need to do is sand, which I'm gonna do anyway, before I put the gloss UTC and then uh, apply the UTC. So guys, if I earned your approval, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel. Our numbers are out the roof. I'm so excited, guys, thanks to you. Also, all of the products that we used in this video are available on our website, rk3designs.com. Check us out. And I'm super excited. We'll be posting our new 2022 schedule here shortly. So check it out and come see us. And remember, until next time, don't be scared, move forward, and be creative.